<laughs> all right. Well, we are all gathered here in the library of the Hastings Center. And um, we're thrilled that um, Elia Dashi is, is going to walk us through some very uh, cutting edge science that stands to revolutionize reproductive reproduction. Um, and, but before we give you the floor, Ellie, I'm going to be a little bit formal uh, and, and embarrass you and say a little bit about you. <laughs> Dr. Dashi is one of the nation's most distinguished physician scientists. He was Dean um, of the School of Medicine and Biological Sciences at Brown, where he undertook many, many innovative, established many, many innovative programs. Um, and basically helped to establish Brown as one of the top medical schools in the country. He was originally trained as an obstetrician gynecologist, which makes it particularly appropriate background for this talk on reproductive technologies. And I understand that um, you were also trained in reproductive endocrinology at Hopkins and in reproductive biology at UC San Diego. And Dr. Adashi is known for having mentored scores and scores of postdocs and early career physician scientists. He's edited or co-edited 16 volumes and 500 publications. I want to say something more personal though. Um, Ellie, you're not only productive, but you're also a very generous colleague who enjoys working with others. And I know, I know you'd be pleased to, to work with some of us. You've talked with me about your interest in co-authoring with some of our folks. And I know, for example, that you've, you've written extensively with Glenn Cohn, who heads the um, Petri Fromm Center at, at Harvard Law School. So you're just incredibly, not only productive, but very, very generous. Dr. Adashi is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and he has been since 1999, when it was called the Institute of Medicine. And he's on numerous boards. I'm just going to name three. He was senior advisor on, to the US uh, State Department on global women's health. He uh, is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he is, importantly, a Hastings Center fellow. And um, Ellie is also a member of our advisory council, and he has been for quite a while, and we're really, really happy that you are on that body. Thank you, Ellie. So, okay, that's enough. <laughs> I'll, turn it over. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. So now that I'm thoroughly embarrassed, I can embark on the, the presentation. I assume you can hear me well. Very and well. I assume that you can see the slides. Very well. Yes. The title of the presentation, as you can see, is Eggs and Sperm from a Buccal Smear. That is, of course, viewed by most people, uh, an absurd statement. What do eggs and sperm have to do with a buccal smear, which we generally deploy to secure a few somatic cells from the inner cheek with an eye towards using those cells to analyze DNA and in some cases to determine the karyotype of the individual in question. The notion though that these cells could somehow or another be converted into eggs and sperm is mind boggling and remains so for me, even though I've been following this field now for well over 10 years and have met some of the leading principals in, per in person, for example, in Japan, uh, as far back as 2012 or 2013. So our discussion today will be about stem cell derived gametes. But before we go there, I think it is very important to appreciate that this is part of an exploding field of science, which is generally referred to as pluripotent stem cells, which come in two varieties, so-called embryonic pluripotent stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. 
either one can give rise to gametes or other cell types as we will be discussing. Before I go there though, I felt compelled to share with you some very recent development that proved exceptionally tantalizing. A series of papers came out just in the last few weeks, which are part of this story, but which do not deal with eggs and sperm, but rather with the derivation of actual embryos from pluripotent stem cells, also referred to sometimes as blastoids. The first paper in this series was from the laboratory of Dr. Jacob Hanna from the Weizmann Institute in Israel, where in some key terms in the title, I think give you a sense of what we're dealing with. ESC stands of course for embryonic stem cells. The term synthetic embryos is actually used here which were grown ex utero, that is to say, in an artificial uterus. You can think of these synthetic embryos as really um, the contemporary version of an immaculate conception. No men or women were involved, no eggs and sperm were involved, simply by guiding embryonic stem cells, embryos, to the degree that we can refer to them as such, were formed. This is an example of the contraption that served as the uterine environment, if you will, to grow these in vitro derived mouse embryos. And here are some of the depictions of these early embryos on days one through five of life. Not long thereafter, we were treated to a series of three papers in various nature journals that were from the laboratory of Magdalena Zernika Getz who divides her time between Cambridge and Caltech. Key terms in the titles of these papers were, again, embryonic stem cells. We might say pluripotent embryonic stem cells from which she was able to derive what she also refers to as synthetic embryos that self-assembled and proceeded to the stages of gastrulation, neurulation, and organogenesis, which is a fairly advanced stage of embryonic development. Even a heart was formed and indeed seen beating in situ, as is shown in the next slide. All I could say is, if this is not unbelievable, <laughs> I don't know what is, but this is a stunning set of developments and it's likely to be extended to innumerable areas um, of science. Uh, this is really just the beginning. Scientists are busy deriving stem cell derived lineages, for example, that will give rise to amacrine neurons. These are cells that reside in the retina. And in some cases, due to disease, need to be replaced if such were feasible. Stem cells may well give rise to these 
hemocrine neurons and in fact cure the blindness that affects these individuals. By the same token, scientists are experimenting with the notion of creating dopaminergic neurons that could, in other words, dopamine producing neurons that could be placed in the striatum in the brain with an eye towards curing Parkinson's disease. At this point, an incurable condition. And then there is this truly remarkable notion of developing motor neurons, neurons that could substitute for defective or injured neurons, for example, in the spinal cord, and in principle, correct or rectify paralysis. You can see the possibilities. They are endless. All we are going to be talking about today is stem cell derived gametes, but I didn't want you to lose sight of the big picture, which is rather astonishing. In vitro gametogenesis, according to many, is now just a matter of time. Science Magazine recognized this last year when it dedicated a full-fledged review to mammalian in vitro gametogenesis, written by the two leading investigators in this area, Mitinori Saito and Katsuhiko Hayashi. The New England Journal of Medicine reached the same conclusion and this year published an extensive review titled Oocytes from Stem Cells by Herbert and Surani from Newcastle and Cambridge in the UK respectively. Clearly, this is now just a question of time and I will of course try to describe to you the history of this story and how we got to this point. Finally, I can share with you that the National Academy of Medicine is planning a 2023 workshop on this very notion. Again, because of the recognition that it's imminent, although a precise date cannot be determined, and it's very likely and plans are being made accordingly that a consensus committee report may follow. This is one of those situations where we may be ahead of the curve. In other words, where we write these reports before the New York Times reports the breakthrough. In most other cases, things happen and then we play catch up. For example, CRISPR-Cas9, a Nobel Prize winning discovery back in 2012, caught us all by surprise. And then we played catch up, having workshops and consensus committees generated in the National Academy of Medicine and elsewhere. This is one attempt to perhaps get ahead of the story, if at all possible. To get us started, I'm going to use an infographic that you're doubtlessly familiar with of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. I found it instructive to note that as they prioritize the topics they wish to tackle in human reproduction, they placed in vitro derived gametes at the top of their list. This was followed by time limits on maintaining embryos in culture, womb replacement, which we already briefly touched upon, preconception screening, whole genome sequencing of embryos and fetuses, genome editing of gametes and embryos, and egg freezing. In vitro gametogenesis, we would have to say is a disruptive technology. Is it achievable in the human? 
remains to be seen. I will definitely show you that it is achievable in the rodent. And is this really a short timeline or are we kidding ourselves when we suggest that this is the case? It is always instructive to revisit Aldous Huxley's Brave New World in 1932, wherein he predicted, among other things, that eggs will be created via ex vivo ovarian cultures, that embryos will be created via in vitro fertilization, and that newborns will be nurtured through what he referred to as ex vivo ectogenesis. He was, of course, spot on with respect to in vitro fertilization, which is now a fact of life, which we all take for granted. He was not that far from the mark when he thought about how exit sperm might be created. He didn't quite use the term in vitro gametogenesis, but he could foresee the potential of this happening. In chapter one of his book, the director of hatcheries and conditioning makes the following comment. One egg, one embryo, one adult, normality, making 96 human beings grow where only one grew before, progress. It's interesting that he made reference to the 96 figure because of course we have 96 well plates uh, routinely in use in every laboratory. And the day is not far when we will have 96 well plates filled with stem cell derived gametes. Although I doubt that Mr. Huxley could foresee all of that at the time. For the longest of time, the notion of in vitro derived gametes would have been deemed impossible because of the so-called Soma germline barrier hypothesis. That hypothesis was formulated by August Weissmann, who was a professor of zoology at the University of Freiburg, who in his book, the germplasm, a theory of heredity, maintained that the germline gives rise to the soma and by dint of that is immortal. On the other hand, he maintained that the soma in turn never gives rise to the germline and is thus mortal. This hypothesis, which held forth for a hundred years or more, has finally yielded to new developments, which I will describe now, which demonstrate that you can take a somatic cell and convert it into a germ cell counterpart. The idea is generally referred to as somatic nuclear reprogramming. And what that means is that you start the process with a differentiated somatic cell, say a skin cell. You convert it by technologies we will briefly discuss into a pluripotent stem cell, which in turn can then be guided into a gametogenic fate if you actually know the necessary instructions or the necessary program that will take you there. The two technologies that essentially put to bed the hypothesis we just discussed include the somatic cell nuclear transfer technology, which came to be in 1958, 
courtesy of John Garden, PhD from Cambridge University, who published a leading paper in Nature titled Sexually Mature Individuals of Xenopus labis, a frog, from the transplantation of single somatic nuclei. What he did is he secured what he called a somatic karyoplast, essentially a nucleus of a somatic cell, transplanted it into an enucleated oocyte, or as he referred to it as an oocytic cytoplast, which gave rise to a quasi-zygote, which proceeded to develop into a blastocyst, which has an inner cell mass, which ultimately gives rise to who we are. But if you use that inner cell mass and disperse it, you can in fact derive embryonic stem cells, which can now go anywhere. In 2006, the process of induction was introduced by Shinya Yamanaka, MD, PhD from Kyoto University, who published a key paper in Cell titled Induction of Pluripotent Stem Cells from Mouse Embryonic and Adult Fibroblast Cultures by Defined Factors. He started, of course, with a somatic cell, say a skin cell, and he transfected that cell with a group of transcription factors, which he identified as essential, and that gave rise to what is now known as induced pluripotent stem cells. So on the one hand, embryonic stem cells, on the other hand, induced pluripotent stem cells. It doesn't really matter which one you use. Each one of those can in principle be guided to become any cell type in the body. Recognizing the importance of this discovery, the Nobel Committee awarded both investigators the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. Which brings us to in vitro gametogenesis, which is just or but one example of this ever expanding field. And the idea is to take a somatic cell skin cell say, and convert it either, either into an embryonic or inducible pluripotent stem cells and then guide it towards a gametogenic fate. Now to do that, you need to know certain things. Well, you need to know what cues this somatic stem cell will need to undergo the transformation we seek you will know, need to know the sequence by which these factors are applied if, again, the program is to be executed properly. And you would need to know the timing in which to apply these various instructions to the somatic cell so that it becomes either a sperm or an egg. And you also need, and that's important, what is known as a niche, that is to say, a surrounding somatic cell, because as you probably know, in the human body, the oocytes, the female germ cells, are surrounded by somatic cells known as granulosa cells and also theca cells. And the same holds true for men, where in the sperm cells in the testes are surrounded by so-called Sertoli cells. And we need those cells because they provide a variety of cues that are essential for the formation of the mature gametes. The beginnings of the field were very modest. In 2003, a science paper was published, the lead author of which was Hans Schuller, now at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Biomedicine, but then a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. 
The title of the paper is Derivation of Oocytes from Mouse Embryonic Stem Cells. And an example of such stem cell, I'm sorry, of such um, oocyte is illustrated in the right lower hand corner of this slide. Still a somewhat early version in the field. That same year, Dr. Toshiaki Noche from Japan reported on the pages of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on embryonic stem cells that can form germ cells in vitro. That year after that, in 2004, George Daly, now the Dean of Harvard Medical School, reported the derivation of embryonic germ cells and male gametes from embryonic stem cells on the pages of Nature. And Rene Rehopera, an investigator from the West Coast at that point in UCSF, reported the spontaneous differentiation of germ cells from human embryonic stem cells in vitro on the pages of human molecular genetics. In the subsequent years, a whole series of papers appeared in influential journals describing germ cell specification pathways in the rodent. In parallel, similar series of papers described germ cell specification pathways in the human. And so by the time we reach 2015, the state of the art is that the germ cell specification pathway we now recognize is not conserved between the rodent and the human. In other words, if we figure it out in the rodent, that does not mean we have figured it out in the human. This will require a special effort. And we also realized that the genetic networks involved are quite distinct between the two species as well, which meant that we couldn't just copy what we learned from one species into another. What we were able to say in 2015 is that you could take embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells all the way to what was known as primordial germ cell-like cells. But we were hard pressed at that point to create the haploid, postmeiotic, mature gamete, which we all seek to see. In a sense, in 2015, we figured out the extragonadal component of the process, but we had yet to figure out the intragonadal component thereof. The final frontier, meaning in vitro gametogenesis all the way, was yet to be accomplished. And that came about in 2016. At that point, Professor Hayashi published on the pages of Nature, a paper titled, Reconstitution in Vitro of the Entire Cycle of the Mouse Female Germline. He started off with embryonic stem cells. He combined them with primordial germ cell-like cells, added the necessary niche or somatic gonadal cells, which led to the formation of primary oocytes, later on M2 oocytes, which could be fertilized and created a blastocyst, that is to say an embryo, which when transferred to appropriate uh, mothers, gave rise to pups. And so for the first time, at least in the rodent, we could start with embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells and go all the way to generating 
uh, in this case, eggs, and fertilize those eggs and generate offspring, at least in a rodent. Some of the same was later reported for the male rodent, a paper that was contributed by Dr. Saitu, titled In Vitro Reconstitution of the Whole Male Germ Cell Development for Mouse Pluripotent Stem Cells. So in the rodent, at least, it seems we are now in a position to take a stem cell and convert it all the way to a uh, uh, gamete. Professor Saitu also tried to take the process to completion in the human, but was unable to do so. However, in 2018, in a, pages, in a paper published on the pages of science, he reported on the generation of human oogonia from induced pluripotent stem cells in vitro. He started with human uh, pluripotent germ cell-like cells, combined them with some somatic cells, and proceeded along the usual line, but could only get it to the oogonial stage. He could never really get it all the way to the conclusion of the process. And so, as we speak about this subject matter today, we can say that we are able to complete the process in the rodent, but have yet to bring it to a successful conclusion in the human, which is why everybody is sitting glued to their chairs and wondering when will that be accomplished and what will that take? It seems we are very close, but we're not quite there yet. What is missing? Well, for one, we don't have gonadal somatic cells, um, and we don't quite know what they're telling their germ cell neighbors. So, here again, we are raising the question of the niche, but as I will show you, that too is being gradually addressed. Here is a very recent paper, this time by Professor Hayashi in Science, titled Generation of Ovarian Follicles from Mouse Pluripotent Stem Cells. So at least in a mouse, we now have the necessary somatic cells that form the niche, which are essential for the final maturation of the um, gametogenic cells. We also need to be very careful with all of this that we faithfully replicate meiosis. We don't want gametes that are in one way or another defective and could cause more trouble than we want uh, to see. There are some very clear-cut requirements for what needs to happen. The, result, the resulting gametes have to have the correct nuclear DNA content. They have to have the normal chromosome content and organization. They have to display appropriate synapses and recombination. And they have to generate viable euploid offspring, that is to say, normal offspring. In other words, anybody who will lay claim to having generated stem cell derived gametes will have to meet these criteria definitely by the time they come to the attention of the FDA. I don't have to tell you that the scientific and translational promise here is enormous. In terms of the advancement of science, this will provide us with an inexhaustible supply of germ cells. It was, would allow scientists to conduct what is known as functional or non-mutant analysis 
that is to say, knock out one gene at a time and ask the question, what does that do to the functionality of the cell? And we could begin to study meaningfully germ somatic cell interactions, which today I have to tell you is essentially a black box. We could also see clinical benefits. We could reverse germ cell failure in individuals who are unable to reproduce, who suffer from one form or another of reproductive failure by providing them with replacement gametes that they may not possess, or by editing their gametes if they are defecting. And this could also be helpful in a technology known as donor mitochondria replacement, which now relies on other women who generously contribute their eggs, but that may not be necessary if we can produce those in vitro. We can also make some predictions about what IVG in vitro gametogenesis will ultimately do to IVF. It will definitely eliminate the need in hormonal stimulation and in the egg retrieval process. It will do away with gamete donation, which currently is necessary in women who for one reason or another cannot produce healthy eggs of their own. And for all we know, it will convert IVF into a laboratory procedure, which means that the entire elaborate IVF enterprise, which we currently witnessed, close to 400 clinics nationwide in the US alone, will have to transform dramatically. It will still require that a physician or a technologist prepare the endometrial cavity for implantation and that the embryo be transferred one way or the other. Whether or not this will cut costs remains to be seen. We've been there before many times. Somehow or another, those aspirations do not always materialize. But clearly, the practice of IVF will be markedly altered and the nature of the discipline of reproductive endocrinology will have to be reevaluated because it's not clear that we will need to train all these physicians who now do IVF um, because the situation will likely change. This will require tight regulation. And by all accounts, this will fall under FDA jurisdiction, specifically at the so-called Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. And in all likelihood, uh, the terminology they like to use is human cells, tissues, and proceed products which they abbreviated HCTPs, uh, clearly artificially derived human gametes will fall under that heading. It is also important, as you know better than most, that in every disruptive human technology, it is important to embark on some form of public deliberation or participatory public engagement. This is, as you know, also a relatively nascent field, definitely in the US, far more developed in Europe, where in many, many national decisions, taxes and others are deliberated with and by the public in ways that we have not even begun to broach. Although I know that many of you are personally familiar with this uh, notion, and there are some active practitioners in this country, for example, Dr. Fishman in Stanford and others, 
who are trying to advance this uh, modality in the United States. All of this, as you probably also well know, in the United States goes back to the 1975 Asilomar Conference on Recombinant DNA, which was obviously a milestone in recombinant DNA technology, but is always brought up as an example of a meeting of experts only and by invitation only. The public was not invited. The public was not asked. And to my knowledge, even the press was not specifically uh, informed, which prompted many prominent individuals, amongst them the late Senator Edward Kennedy, who in, on May the 9th, 1975, in a speech he gave at the Harvard School of Public Health said, when science developed techniques that fundamentally change society, society has the right to determine how the technique is to be used, whether it should be developed in the first place, and if so, under what constraints. Senator Javits, a contemporary of Senator Kennedy from New York, uh, followed up with some similar statements, which I will not discuss today. In 1995, the National Academy of Medicine issued a report on the social and ethical decision-making in biomedicine led by Harvey Feinberg, later the president of the National Academy of Medicine, where in, of course, the issue of public deliberation was heavily discussed. In 2008, the National Academy of Medicine issued a report that was directly dedicated to this issue, titled Public Participation, in this case, in Environmental Assessment and Decision-Making. <clears throat> and one of the statements I took out of that report is that, quote, public participation is intrinsic to democratic governance. Sheila Jasanoff, who many of you may know from Harvard Medical School, in her book, The Science, Science and Public Reason, maintained that the issue is no longer whether the public should have a say in technical decisions, but how? In many ways, Professor Jasanoff, as you know, is the leading spokesperson, I think, in this country uh, for the idea of participatory public engagement. We've been very impressed with all of these efforts. And in 2019, we wrote a paper on this very issue directly related to stem cell derived gametes, wherein we involved some of the leading principles like Jacob Hanna I mentioned earlier from the Weizmann Institute, Azim Surani from Cambridge University and Katsuhiko Hayashi from Japan. Uh, that dealt specifically with the idea of making sure that before we unleash this technology on an unsuspecting public, we make every effort to consult the public. I don't have any particular reason to think that the public will object, although one really never knows. I think when you highlight the clinical benefits that could be derived from this technology, particularly allowing individuals who are infertile or barren for whatever reason to start a family, 
that tends to speak to most of us. To give you one example of how this is happening or where it's happening, here is a report of precisely what we're talking about, which uh, transpired in Belgium. Uh, the title of which is Enthusiasm, Concern, and Ambivalence in the Belgian Public's Attitude Towards In Vitro Gametogenesis. That's precisely what we need to deal with as well. Some of you may recognize amongst the authors Guido Pennings, who is a known ethicist, uh, albeit from, um, uh, obviously from Europe, uh, from Belgium specifically. I will close uh, more or less where we started with the notion of in vitro derived gametes as an item on the horizon of many fronts, including, of course, the horizon of bioethics. And perhaps the next time, if we have that opportunity, we can dedicate the presentation not just to the science, but also to the legal and ethical ramifications of in vitro gametogenesis, which are not only plentiful, but also rather complex. So with that, I will close here and thank you for the opportunity to share this afternoon with you. I hope some of this proved to be instructive and useful, this is not going away. We might, we might just as well get comfortable with it and recognize that it's coming our way. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ellie. That, that was a tour de force across so, so many decades. Um, can you? say a little more, I read your piece in Cell Press Review where you said a little bit more about um, the uses of you know, artificial gametes. I mean, you spent a lot of time in this talk on how it was, what its impact was gonna be on IVF, but I know that you're anticipating other, you're connecting the dots to a lot of other things. Could you give some other examples? Absolutely. I mean, um... There are several entities in you know, human reproduction that unfortunately compromise one's ability to start a family. Um, for example, Turner syndrome, which you probably heard of, a condition where in the women uh, simply do not possess uh, eggs, uh, with, which would be obviously essential if a family were to be started. Imagine we could take a skin cell from such a woman, convert it into an egg, combine it with her husband's sperm, and then proceed through IVF to hopefully a normal gestation, delivery, and birth. Similar conditions afflict men. And so there are a whole host of situations wherein infertility could not be overcome unless we were to provide this individual with a gamete. Up until now, that, mean, that meant a donor gamete, um, a donor egg, or a donor sperm, which, you know, is not without merit and at present is really the state of the art. But we can clearly see that it would be an advancement if one could use homologous eggs, homologous sperm, to achieve a pregnancy so that the parents are in fact directly related to their offspring, um, which is 
perhaps a debatable or um, a relative point to make. But in the final analysis, I think we can all see the benefit of uh, parenting a child that is entirely our own. Um, that's not to say that we love the other children less, et cetera, et cetera. But there are medical circumstances and not a limited number of those wherein this could make all the difference. So yes, in IVF, it's not so much a matter of substitution. It's more a matter of simplification, you could argue, of the technology. Currently, women spend a significant amount of time uh, being stimulated by hormonal injections, being monitored by ultrasound for the development of their follicles before they ever get to the point of their eggs being retrieved. This could all be bypassed and an egg could be generated in a lab, fertilized by sperm given by the husband, embryos created and transferred. So in many ways, this could simplify what is currently a significant undertaking for a woman who may be infertile and in need of IVF. And at least every instinct in our body tells us that this should lower the cost of the procedure, which at this point, as you all know, is not insubstantial. Is that really going to happen? I already alluded to is to be seen. But uh, in principle, if you don't need all this injection, all these multiple appointments, all these ultrasounds, you would think that the total cost should be reduced. But the price has to be I will tell. So, uh, yeah, we have some questions only in the room. So, Please. Oh, thanks. Hi, Dr. Dashi. It's Carolyn, a research scholar. Hi. There we go. Um, <laughs> one question that's simple is can you generate an egg from a from a male buccal swab, right? So can you take a swab from a yeah. I'm sorry, from a male? Biological male. Can you take a swab from a biological male? I always get XX and XY mixed up, which is embarrassing. Um, and then generate an egg cell. I see. Meaning, that's, yeah, that's start with a somatic cell from a male and end up with an egg, you say. Yeah. Uh, well, that has never been done. I suspect there are many obstacles to getting there. But I'm not dismissing your question uh, um, out of hand. I will give it some more thought. I can only say that nobody ever considered that, shall we say, worthy of practical pursuit, although it may be worthy of theoretical pursuit. And I'll give it some thought. I would think- oh, Yeah, I think it has enormous practical- I would yeah. think it would be yeah. tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Male yeah. couples, trans couples. Trans. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then I have a second question. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I think that's important for you to be out there. Yeah. Okay, second question. You seem very convinced this is a good thing and that it's coming and we ought to prepare for it. So I'm wondering more about the public participation imperative. So is the goal to actually understand, appreciate, and take under consideration what publics think? Or is the goal to get the public on board? And apologies for actually not maybe having the year 2019 paper. No, no, <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's difficult. And this is new to, um, you know, to the land of the free and the brave. Uh, we, um, we are not used to this at all. Um, 
And it's there is a fine line between hearing what the public has to say and following that, if you will, verdict. Um, I think in Europe, every effort is made to not just listen to the public, but also oblige the public to the degree possible. I mean, you and I understand that when it comes to matters of national security, we're not going to necessarily inquire with every citizen what needs to be done. But on matters like this, I think it will be helpful and only democratic, if I can use that term, uh, to let the public have a say. Now, does that mean if the public uh, shows us a thumb down that we will abstain from proceeding? I would be surprised if that were the case. Plus, I would say opinions change. We may have to sample the public on more than one occasion. All told, I think you can tell from my struggling with the answer that this is difficult with little precedent, uh, no tradition whatsoever in the United States, and therefore very little clarity as where we will go with this. I'm, shall we say, upbeat to the degree that it is difficult for me to see that the public, if presented with all the facts, will be opposed. But remember, this is also the land of the um, abortion debate and the land we're in. Um, concepts of uh, reproduction are viewed very differently by segments of the population. So uh, you know, pro-choice and pro-life interests are likely going to intersect here. Where it's going to end up, I don't know. I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, um, no. We only have a, a couple of minutes left. I think there's going to be concern about this from both the left and the right, and that you have extremely uh, unidirectional expectations. I, I can't imagine an area of science where that would be less controversial. And to, you know, a super proponent of public engagement, um, but I think we have to do it with eyes wide open to expect that there might be a great deal of resistance from both the left and the right. Well, you could. I wonder what other people around the table think. You could well be right, uh, but that's people precisely. Are accustomed to IVF. Precisely. The people, the people who are accustomed to IVF, why? Well, this is the logical step. So they'd be for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But also, there might be. Sure, and sure, there'll be resistance, yeah. just like there was to IVF. Yeah. I mean, I, one of the things I think that that. Ellie has in mind is the recent experience in the UK when the public was consulted about mitochondrial yes. transfer. And indeed, there was an embrace of it because it could be used for reproductive purposes that made sense to run of the mill people, contrary to the expectations of people like Sheila Jasanoff and Marcia Darnowski and John Evans and a lot of us, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, and they had hours and hours of real public engagement yeah. and debate in their what's in their in their parliament. I mean, true exploration of the issues. Well, there's some concerns. There's there's some questions about that. There's some people that. Okay. <laughs> Anybody want to make a comment before we have to go? Last comment. I saw a lot of heads shaking, so don't be shy. <laughs> I'm a political scientist, and so what I will say is that um, my critique of public engagement, deliberation, um, 
claim is it's always we need to, we need to, somebody needs to, somebody needs to, but nobody takes the responsibility to do it. And, it's a, and in some ways that means that science continues to move forward and that you kind of make those claims. And it's so like we've got trained to say, and then science moves on. And there was no public debate of deliberation to my knowledge in China or Japan where a lot of this work is being done. Nor is there public group deliberation in any of the Eastern European countries um, where some of this research is also probably done. We don't know about it. Complicated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> right. Uh, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you who are young and are thinking about this, I am struck by the extent to which whenever a new technology of this kind comes online, there's a series of very powerful arguments that we can all articulate. And to me, as somebody who articulates those critical arguments by nature, um, I have to remember that exactly those arguments were made against IVF. Um, and if you recognize the extent to which and accept the extent to which we've gotten on board with IVF, you've got to be thinking to yourself, well, am I, am I really prepared to stand by these arguments? Do they really hold up to scrutiny the way my gut tells me they do? It's just be prepared for the, that's what Leon Cass said point from Ellie et al. That's exactly what Leon Cass said about IVF. Anything you can imagine would say, you'd say against this. <laughs> right, Ellie? Yeah, yes, we. I don't know anybody. You're not on board with IVF? I don't know anybody who's not on board with IVF. I have concerns about IVF. IVF is not a I, I, I understand theory. I understand theory. I understand theoretical concerns. I understand theoretical concerns. Your partner, your mother, your daughter wants to have a biologically related child and can't. Are you going to, on the grounds of social concerns, say no? But, but are you suggesting that no one is I know, I know you've raised the issues, and I would raise the issues too. But I know the same no, But I have another question I asked. But are you suggesting that because a whole bunch of people do use it, that means that there aren't people who aren't doing it because they have those social issues? Oh, I didn't I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't know. But you know, that's sort of like the abortion question. I mean, I live in a society where I would like people to be able to choose whether or not to avail themselves of certain technologies. I think my question is the same. You're just saying, I'm saying that you, it seems that you're using the fact that there are great numbers of people using IVF as proof that those questions have been put to rest in any practical sense. But we don't know how many people are not using that technology because they have objections to it. It may well be that there are people who aren't using it on the basis of those objections. But what all I was saying was that we know that many people are using it and the kinds of concerns that were originally articulated have not been materialized in the way that people like I said they would be. And we have to get on board, with, we have to take on board that reality. So for everyone's sake, what were some of the concerns you were, you had? That no, are better not no, 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 say it, they were. Listen, anybody, at this, you don't need to think hard about them. I mean, what are we going to do? What's going to happen to the nature of the parent-child okay. relationship? Are we going to commodify children? Look, any high school student can come up with the concerns and that doesn't make them unreal, but we have to take seriously the fact that they haven't materialized in the way that we said they did. Oh, believe me. I, I, <laughs> Right. Absolutely. When you think about things, literally, yeah. every embryo that's produced is given a grade. There's that here. Yeah. That parents then must choose which grade embryo <laughs> they want. And if you're given anything less than an A minus, you are doing another round of egg. But Karen, so this is what Ellie's technology is about. Polygenic risk scores are going to make that much more intense. 
If you're going to be, right. you're going to be yes. grading a right. movie A every day. Yes. Right. So how can right. We, right. So, so, so it's so, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just saying, I do think no, the I modification agree. things have come to pass. It doesn't make it unethical or for some, right? Like it's not a, not a non-starter because we now commodify and grade embryos. It's now just routinely done. But it has come to pass. I'm and that's why it's wrong because I'm, a lot of things are I think you're right. But the public can, it's like, I've got the good ones. They, they're not critical about the fact that you're doing great. No, not at all. People are very open. I, yeah. I attended my A embryo. Yeah. I had yeah. five A embryos. Yeah. I had three A's and two yeah. B's. Right. So I told the doctor that she was among the A's. Right. And now you're going to do the, the, the score. So you're going to see what college you're going to see. We're going to see A pluses. Yeah. <laughs> 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 A plus, a plus, plus. Yeah, so I, right. you guys can... I don't understand your point because these moral problems still exist and they're going to be exacerbated by, you know, yeah. all the, 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 the development. So, so but, but Eric is saying, yeah. but what's Eric's advice to the next generation? Yeah. I mean, just because there it is being used doesn't answer whether the moral questions have been resolved. I'm not saying the moral questions have been resolved. I'm saying that in these earlier rounds, when we made predictions, they didn't materialize. Now, Carolyn's saying that they did. They well, just don't care. well, well, well. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. They, um, they are. It looks like they're. They, they, the, again, the material ramifications aren't yet what any of us fear, right? I mean, it's an individual within an individual family. They're choosing, you know, the embryo that they. Um, think is the high, highest quality, right? And in a way, be irrational not to, as Julian yes, yes. would say, right? Um, so I'm not suggesting that's not disturbing. I am suggesting that we have to be careful about exaggerating the impacts of this because they didn't materialize the way we said they were. They're not on a scale. They're not on a scale. Yeah, yeah anticipate. Now, but, you know, and thank God. There are things to worry about still, because otherwise we've got beyond business, right? <laughs> and, you know, if you want to worry, start thinking about polygenic scores as you know, okay. choosing among A grade embryos. Yeah, yeah. Right, Ellie? <laughs> <laughs> I never disagree with Eric. <laughs> well, this is exactly what yeah. I hoped you would do: stimulate us to have our own little insight, <laughs> <laughs> our, our own discussion. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, I'm here. My brother and sister-in-law's A embryo is one and a half weeks old. <laughs> 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 yeah. Using it the way they graded them. I'm mean, using A, you know, like using a grading sense intuitively. Right. So it goes to that and the, I mean, the, the, well, that's what they mean. Like three but they do, they do so mean that. that. They're not. They're not bluebirds and red, and cardinals. Right. They're not categories that are. You know. Yeah, they're not indicative. Yeah, they. Well, what else would they use? Right. Yeah. We, we do seem to have also passed over this doubling down on the importance of a genetic child that, that you did mention, Ellie, yeah. but, uh, but uh, insisted on the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, probable value of. And I'm not sure that that's, that's really the case, uh, particularly when we're looking at uh, the current state of uh, uh, adoption foster, foster care systems uh, and many different ways of, uh, of raising and being part of a child's life. Uh, and so the use of resources and especially the uh, concentration of the use of these technologies in very elite groups uh, raise concerns about how we're thinking about uh, putting them together at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the question. Right. That's not the question. That's going to do a normativity. The idea of, well, you know, if you really want to be a parent, yeah. there's a technology for you, and I hope you have money for it. Yeah. The film Private Life, I think it's called, is really good on this. It's a fictional film. It's about a, a, a couple in the oh, in hunt for a child. With the con? A, a, a Paul Giamatti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and it's, it's amazing. Huh. Huh. It's amazing. Yes, it is. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Because you realize you're being pitched, you're being spun a story about adoption, you're being spun a story about fertility. And literally, it's like, if you've got $10,000, I've got a technology for you. Or I've got an 18 year old for you. It's amazing. Thank you, Ali. Ellie, Thank you, you did it for us. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Well, like, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.